Kim, Chloe, and Kylie filed to trademark their kids' names. That is our first headline. Our second headline, here's what the average American spends on non-essential items. Those two headlines plus the big idea tying them all together and so much more on today's Money in the Morning. I'm Bobby Rebel from the Financial Grown Up Podcast, coming to you from my very grown up kitchen in New York City. And I'm Joe Salcihai from my mom's basement in Detroit, Michigan. And this is the podcast where we cover two recent stories ripped from the financial press. We don't just read them, though, like some other podcasts. We get into why they matter to you, to your wallet, and then, of course, what you can do with it. How can you invest with it, save, and, of course, become ideally debt-free, more effectively get there faster. And then we're going to wrap it all up with one big idea at the end of today's show that you can take with you for a better financial life. Money in the Morning is brought to you by Tiller. Manage your money 10 times faster in a spreadsheet with Tiller, the only service that connects your banks to Google Sheets and Excel with your daily spending, transactions, and balances. Go to stackingbenjamins.com forward slash Tiller for more information. Good morning, Joe. Good morning, Bobby. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. I'm settling in with my coffee. I'm drinking iced coffee today. I am drinking ice water today. It's amazing. So it, it's amazing. Mom gives this away for free. She does. I love freebies, <laughs> but that gets me in trouble with the whole Marie Kondo movement because I have so much free stuff. I wanted to say CRAP, but so much free goods in my home that I bring home from various conferences and business trips that it's definitely not. Um, what's the, what? What's the uh, acronym for when you Marie Kondo something? Like KonMari. KonMari. The KonMari. It is not in compliance with KonMari. No, I for think, sure. I think all water, free though. free t-shirts and mugs and all that stuff that we get. I think water not is... Not the extra mugs. Water is <laughs> always KonMari. So we, we got yes. a bunch. But today we're talking about the Kardashians. That's always We fun. are. Yeah. Let's get this party started, shall we? Let's do it. Who needs coffee when you have money in the morning headlines? You still need coffee. I I am drinking my iced coffee. Well, I did not have my coffee earlier. So we're taping this, let's say late morning. Um, and uh, I still am drinking my coffee and getting started with that. So there you go. Late morning, a.k.a. afternoon. A.k.a. <laughs> afternoon. <laughs> All right, let's get to that first headline with the Kardashians, as you so aptly teased. Um, all right, so this is a story from the New York Post. It is by Francesca Bacardi. Very well written, concise story here. Kim, Chloe, and Kylie filed to trademark their kids' names. Kim Kardashian, Kylie Jenner, and Chloe Kardashian. Some of the others are making sure their kids turn a profit. Kim Kardashian, Chloe Kardashian, and Kylie Jenner have all filed to trademark the names. Of their kids, Saint North and Chicago West, as well as True Thompson and Stormy Webster, according to documents obtained by TMZ. The mothers plan to use their children's names on various products, including a clothing line, toys, and Kylie 21. By the way, she's the one that's an almost billionaire. She may be a billionaire by now. Specifically filed to trademark Stormy World, which was the theme for Stormy's epic first birthday party. Kylie's boyfriend and Stormy's father, Travis Scott, also designed custom Stormy World tour merchandise for her first birthday. Unbelievable. The Kardashian Jenners also requested the ability to sign endorsement deals to hawk others' products. The application doesn't list specifics. Kourtney Kardashian and Rob Kardashian and their kids do not appear to be involved in the trademark filing. So not all the Kardashians. Kourtney, for now, we don't know if she's doing that. Big story here, Joe. It's it's pretty. Um, at first blush, you think, and I know as people are listening to this on their morning commute or wherever they are, they're going, "Oh, come on, really? You're you're trademarking your kid's name?" And then you think about it, though, and you think about where these people make their money. It really actually is is pretty brilliant. 
I think I actually totally support this because first of all, if they don't, someone else could. So number one, it is a defensive move. And if I were in their position, which I'm clearly not, I would have done it right after their birth. I think I'm surprised it took them this long to do it, especially when they certainly came up with creative and unique names that you should always do that. And in fact, I have heard stories that people as when they choose a name for their future child, actually look if the Twitter handle is available or if the URL is available. And I will tell you for my youngest child, I do have his URL. So I have that reserved for him if he ever wants to have, for example, his, his webpage that he will have his name reserved for him. So he has that choice and he actually has a Twitter handle reserved for him that he does not use at this point. He's too young, but I, I did reserve it. So I think that all parents should be thinking ahead to the future digital assets of their children. Well, I think this is interesting. There's even a, there's a whole different story just when you talk about digital assets and people selling, you know, stuff or grabbing the Twitter handle or whatever it might be. Look at how many times that's happened to different stars. I was speaking to a, um, Guy, Professor Jamie Hopkins, who's with, uh, he does retirement research for Carson Wealth Management, a big financial planning firm. And he and I, once we got done talking about the issue we were talking about for that, we started talking about digital assets and about how, and, and, and this story kind of borders on this, Bobby, this idea that, that what are your digital assets worth? Like somebody who's 30 today might have a decent online footprint. And when they pass away, I think the way terms of service work, according to this professor, is that, you know, you, you say goodbye bye to your ownership of that. So w what is that actually worth? And is there a way to keep that in the family? Um, I don't know. Clearly for somebody who works online all day like that, the, the, it's, it's worth a lot. But even for the average person, like let's say you've got a decent Facebook presence and that's where you put a bunch of your photos you know, you pass away, according to a lot of the terms of service stuff that this professor was talking about, those then go off into the Ethernet. You don't own that stuff anymore, and neither do does uh, your relatives. Right. This is an area that is still evolving. I do know in Facebook, there is a way that you can um, designate somebody that if you were to pass away or become, you know, ill and you can't access it or something, there is someone that I think can have access to your account. I don't know about ownership, but I do know there is something on Facebook where you can designate somebody that can, can at least get into that account and maintain it, maybe make it some kind of a memory site, whatever is appropriate. Isn't it funny, though, thinking ahead about all that stuff, how important that is and how a lot of, and this is the other thing the professor brought up, you know, a lot of wills and trusts don't cover any of these digital assets. They don't talk about them. They say, Hey, here's the cuckoo clock. I got, you know, that was grandma's, but they don't talk about, here's the, here's the password to my Twitter feed uh, yeah. so that you can get in and and, uh, well, there is there is a provision in wills, and this is going back to my CFP training, and I forget the exact term, but there is something that basically designates anything that is not sure. specified. This yeah. is what we want it to go to. So you would fall into that, of course. Sure, pour um, over. But stuff. yeah, it's something that, that should be acknowledged and should be um, there should be some thought put into how you want who you want to run your online assets if you are no longer available um, to do that. And I think that is something that will change in the estate planning business. And this is one of the the few times where I think if you're 30, you it matters more to you than if you're 70. Like for my mother-in-law, all this stuff is, she has zero online presence, no digital footprint. Well, hardly any digital footprint. And, you know, I look at my kids at 23, their whole life is online. Yeah. And I think, look, with the Kardashians, I think that I, I really, people might roll their eyes at this. I think it's absolutely, as I said, it's defense and it's also offense because this is their bed. Their kids are going to anyway. Th these people do not have any privacy at all. And that's how they've made their, their business and they've done very well, well at it and they're good at it. This has been going on now for, and it's moving into the next generation. And it's kind of like with, you know, children of any celebrity, you don't really get to choose who your parents are. So these children are going to be pulled into it no matter what, at least in this way, they can control it. And if they want to monetize with these products, as it looks like they will, great. But they could also just shut it down and not, and at least they've protected the children from someone else taking advantage of them. Sure. So they're keeping their family business in the family which is also smart is protecting what is effectively a family business or really a successful one, but it's a family business, much like many of us have financial businesses that we might want to pass on to the next generation. You think this is easier because the kid's name isn't Bill Smith or Tom Smith, 
that their name is Chicago West. Like that, that makes it easier to distinguish that this is specifically this person instead of, you know, my friend Tom Smith, when he used to give financial planning talks, he would always begin his talk by saying, hi, my name's Tom Smith. No, it really is. Cause it just <laughs> seems like this generic thing, nothing generic about these kids' names. Well, I think for the most part, this family has been very deliberate in their choices of things like children's names. So I think that was by design. I think that they kind of knew that it was worth doing. And I think that, look, they, they're all named with K's, all the children of that generation. So wow. they give a lot of thought historically as a family, um, every generation to some kind of plan for how they're going to name their children. So it's not surprising at all because they're, they're all K's, the, 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 parents. So you, it makes sense. You, I think that they, they knew what they're doing all along. I think they're yeah. really smart and people that write off the Kardashians as being anything, but very, very smart are mistaken kinda, in my opinion. Kind of dangerous. Let's say hi to everybody who's hanging out with us on Facebook. We do these live in front of a Facebook studio audience. You too can join us. I know that would make your day. I know. Here's, here's how you do it. You head to facebook.com forward slash iStack Benjamins, and that's how you find us. And Kelly is here. Gregory is here. Amika's here hanging out with us. Than is hanging out with us today. Thanks to everybody. Kevin's here, and Andy is here. Andy says Chicago West sounds like a school district. It, it kind of does, doesn't it? Well, how about Northwest? That's right. That's just a, you know, a direction. How, and I remember Kim joking that they would never name their baby that, and then they did. Ta-da. Uh, Gregory asks, he says, I wonder if when people started putting together IP laws, they ever thought they'd be used to protect the rights to children's names. I don't think so. I think this is kind of pushing the envelope. I've, have you ever heard of this before? Um, I have not heard of it, but I do think that there is, as I said, a lot of attention being focused on the idea of reserving a URL or reserving a handle on a social media network when you do have a baby, because people, especially, I think there might be a movement away from naming people sort of generic names, because if you do have something, you know, like maybe if your last name is Smith, which is a common last name here, maybe you choose a more, uh, a less popular first name to make sure that it's more unique yeah. so they can get the URL. Well, and I'm thinking maybe not for children, Gregory, but certainly people have trademarked their names before where the name becomes a brand. I mean, it wouldn't it wouldn't surprise me. It, well, definitely somebody like a Paul Mitchell, you know, would would have a trademark name as as their brand. I'm thinking maybe, you know, a Cher or a Madonna. Like it seems like it'd be very easy to trademark something like that. And that's probably why they do it also. Yeah. But it's yeah, I think it's something worth talking about. So are we getting to our takeaway? Absolutely. I think today's takeaway is for all of us. We never think about our digital assets and protecting our digital assets. And at the very least, having it in your estate plan or wherever people can see your your digital footprint, like how to get into those accounts, how to how to manage all that stuff. That's that's number one. But number two, what is what is that worth? Like the, for some of us that that has a monetary value. What is that worth? I think it's going to be worth more and more, Joe. I think we're going to be paying a lot more attention to this issue. And the Kardashians are pioneers once again. Yeah, I agree. All right, let's go to our second headline. And this one comes to us from The Motley Fool. All right, and it is by Maury Backman. Here is what average what the average American spends on non-essential expenses. Hint, it is a lot. And it's hurting us in many ways. All right, here we go. Most of us work hard for our money and want to enjoy it in different ways. For some, that means paying for vacations and leisure. For others, it means spending a modest fortune on restaurant meals, store-bought coffee, and takeout. No matter what your favorite luxury entails, chances are it eats up a large chunk of your earnings. And that's fine if your savings are in a solid place. Most Americans, however, aren't in that boat. An estimated 40% of U.S. adults don't have the money and savings to cover a mere $400 emergency. That's a stat we've heard a lot before, guys. Meanwhile, 42% aren't setting funds aside for retirement. Wow. Because their income is otherwise maxed out. The sad part, we are spending so much on non-essentials that we are compromising our financial security in the process. Okay, here's where we see how ugly the situation is, Joe. The average American spends an estimated $697 a month on non-essential expenses. 
That according to a new study, new survey by TD Ameritrade. Not shockingly, although I personally would not have guessed this, Joe, but the article says, not shockingly, millennials are the worst offenders in this regard, spending a whopping 838 a month on expenses that are nice, but technically needless. Baby boomers, meanwhile, spend an average of 683 a month, while Gen Xers, which is you and me, waste the least money, woohoo, at $588 a month. That's- so first, let's just stop and talk about the generational divide on this, what, what they're calling, according to their definitions, this, you know, sort of discretionary spending. I would have thought that. I, I would, oh, go ahead. Well, I, I would have thought that the older you are, the 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 less wasteful spending you would have had because it seems like we become more of a convenient society. So the younger you are, the more you get used to the conveniences. And I don't know. My initial defense of millennials in this piece was, well, they grew up with a lot of these convenience. So you know, if if mom stopped at Starbucks on the way to work every day, and you're a kid in the back seat, then stopping at Starbucks becomes a part of your daily routine. That's interesting. Yeah, I was surprised about the millennials because I do feel that they, many of them are under so much financial pressure from student debt and trying to save up for things like maybe buying a first home. And now, I mean, millennials go up to age, I think 36, 37, they're in theory getting married and having kids. And so that's a time when you really can have a lot of overhead and maybe not the wiggle room for discretionary spending. So I was surprised about that. The baby boomers, not so much because they sort of came of age during the boom times in the 1980s um, when we had songs like Madonna's Material Girl. We were talking about Madonna a few minutes ago. Um, And so there was a lot of spending. That was the, you know, golden era of the mall um, when the baby boomers were sort of in the middle... um, I don't know, middle age bracket. So I thought the baby boomers would be the biggest spenders or maybe us Gen Xers, but I don't know. Why are Gen Xers sort of the best at this? That's what I can't figure out at all. Uh, I don't know. I have no idea. And maybe, maybe it's just a certain point in time because, you know, when, when I started off in my financial planning career, uh, a lot of baby boomers were in crunch time. And for those people, they were putting as much money towards saving away as possible. They finally, the kids had started to at least get to the point that they could take care of themselves. Maybe they were they were um, uh, starting to, to graduate from high school, maybe into college or past college. And they're really focused on retirement and getting enough money together. So maybe that's why that right now Gen X is kind of in that bullseye where if I don't save a lot of money and I don't control these expenses, maybe, maybe that's it. I can't think of, I can't think of a reason why Gen, and listen, I'm part of Gen X. So I think, oh no, this is cool. We are awesome. But but I think it's, but it probably has more to do with, yeah, I'm 50 years old. Well, I'm 51 now. I'm 51 years old in retirement, you know, whether I want it to be or not might not be that far away. It is a reality. And if you are over 50, you can put more into your retirement savings in many cases. So maybe it's becoming more of a uh, reality. And also, of course, a lot of people our age are paying for college tuitions for children. Right. And that can be a budget crunch. I mean, you've saved fully ahead of time, but usually there's some sort of hybrid approach going on where you've got some savings, but somebody is coming out of your cash flow. All right, let's get into the articles part where they talk about how you actually define non-essentials, because this is what I thought was really interesting here. And I'm curious for our Facebook live audience that is um, commenting as we go along, whether these are things that you think would be defined as basic. So these are things that the article defines as non-essentials, but maybe the people in the survey did think were essential. All right, ready? Number one, vacations, restaurant meals, coffee, electronics, entertainment, gym memberships, streaming services, that means things like Netflix, spa services, and expensive clothing, clothing and accessories. So those are the things that they are calling non-essentials that a lot of the respondents, according to this piece, uh, listed as basic. So the people answering this consider, for example, spa services as a basic. Yes. I'm not sure about that. I would put that as a non-essential. You can do a home facial or not at all. Some of these I can can (laughs) defend, but I can't, I can't find a way to defend the massage. I, I, you know. Yeah. And I mean, expensive clothing accessories. Yeah, I don't know. Well, if it's know. if it has to do with your job, like I know jobs where you have to look good, you have to look a certain True. way. I mean, whether you want to spend a lot on clothing or not, you have to look a certain 
part. Uh, I remember, you know, when I was a financial planner, well, I came on the financial grown-up show and talked about how I thought I could go cheap on my shoes and were these really cheap Plastic shoes. Shoes. Yeah. And the second I got rid of my cheap shoes, my mentor said to me, he's like, dude, it's about time you get rid of those cheap shoes. Everybody noticed it. Nobody told me. And, uh, and in my job, when you're managing money, whether you want to or not, you have to look a certain way. Although I didn't trust people that looked too good in, in that business. I want them to look professional, but I didn't want them to look like they're making a bunch of money off of me. That was, that was not good. But, but, but so yeah. I, I can kind of defend that one. I can also, you know, um, our, our friend Laura Vanderkam uh, has done a lot of studies about uh, about how professional people work better with vacations. So where, you know, my grandparents would have said a vacation is completely uh, discretionary and something that we don't need. I think there's a lot of people in these high pressure packed careers that go, no, uh, I have to have a vacation so that I can do well at work. True. And, and I would also say electronics. I mean, if it's something like a cell phone that you do need to do your job and to communicate with people, with your family, that of course is something that I do consider an essential, even though of course, for most of, for many people's lifetimes, we didn't even have them until we were adults. I think I got my first cell phone. I already had a job. I was certainly out of college. Um, one of my first jobs, I think I got a cell phone and I sort of didn't understand why I really needed it. I thought it would kind of be rude to to be interrupted throughout my life. If I had the cell phone and my, my work wanted to give me one and I had to have it. And I remember pushing back. No, I don't want a cell phone. Now we can't go anywhere. I don't want to go walk the dog without my cell phone, Joe. I wasn't listening to what you're saying. I was checking my Instagram. No, I'm kidding. (laughs) That's a bad joke. Than here says I have chronic back pain. I need that massage. I think Than's kidding, but, but maybe for, maybe for somebody. Yeah. I mean, Valid. That's medical though. If, if it goes under medical, then that would be, yeah. But it, it, yeah. And I see Greg is talking about coffee would be considered a basic. It doesn't have to be takeout coffee, arguably restaurant meals. If your schedule is such that it's impractical to prepare food at home, like an attorney with kids. The one thing I, I like to tell people when they, they bring up this question, because it comes up a lot, you know, what is really a need versus a want is if tomorrow your income stopped, both you and your spouse are all income sources. And I'm a big believer in multiple income sources for this reason. If it stopped, what do you drop? And if it stops and you don't know when the next income right. is coming in, what do you drop? And you might drop all these things. Sure. You just might. And, and I Even think, though, yeah, the vacation will make you feel better. You, you probably would drop it. Yeah, no, good point. I think that yeah, uh, you and I both have gone through these times in our lives when income was scarce and you were really worried about where the next meal was going to come from. I remember being along the side. I don't know about the next meal, but income was scarce. <laughs> right, <laughs> yeah. right. Well, I wasn't do... that bad. No. <laughs> my mine was mine was very very bad, and I remember it being being very worried sometimes. And certainly, then the vacation. I'm like, I don't care if it's going to make me work better. I got to figure out the next meal. And that's a frustrating place to be, by the way, that I think a lot of people don't understand is when someone is fighting for that next, you know, I, I would love to, I remember being frustrated because I couldn't think long term because I was so busy fighting the day to day battle. And I knew I was never going to win that way. Like you're never going to win if you're fighting for next week, you have to build a reserve, you have to, you know, manage, but, but, but I was just doing everything I could to get through to next week. And it's so, it's so painful uh, in that spot. And, and you and you do learn how you truly define essentials versus non-essentials. And I think that in that situation, and it goes to, you know, you don't know what you're going to do until you're in that situation, but your definition, if it's, if you're defining this list as this article in the Motley Fool does as what you consider essential, your income stops, you're going to have a very different definition of what is really essential if you don't know where the next income stream is coming from. Yeah, and I think that's our takeaway today, which is there's no dictionary discrepancy between needs and wants, but it's one of those things that when you're in the situation, I think you know, I think you really know when the coffee is important and when you can put it down. Exactly. All right, before we get to the big idea, let's talk about Tiller I, for a little bit. I love talking about Tiller. Define your financial future. And no, but seriously, Joe, because if you use something like Tiller, and we're obviously fans of Tiller here, it's going to organize your finances in a spreadsheet so you know exactly what's going on. So you can be better prepared if you do get into a situation where you do have to cut down to only the essential expenses. And having that visibility is going to help you be 
better prepared because you can't argue with the numbers when you see the actual numbers. The difference between Tiller and your basic Mint app or Clarity Money is that because it's a spreadsheet base, you can change it if you don't like it. And I know some people go, oh, I'm not good with computers. I'm not great with spreadsheets. They start off with these templates so you don't have to go through any of the pain of creating your own spreadsheet. So if you decide to kick the tires on Tiller, head to stackingbenjamins.com forward slash Tiller, T-I-L-L-E-R, and uh, you'll get not only a couple months for free that way, but they also, if you decide to buy, then they send us a little thank you for sending you their way. And uh, that's how we keep podcasting at Money in the Morning. So thank you very much if you do that. You ready? All right. Do we have any guilt for our big idea? I, I, I was just looking through all of this uh, stuff. They're talking about me being in the basement right now. So we're having a very a lot, a lot of comments going on here. Very exciting thing. Uh, Gregory says, I think Joe's talking about cyclical poverty. Absolutely. Yeah, that's the technical term, cyclical poverty. I didn't think about it that way. I thought it about, oh my goodness, how are we going to do next week? That's that that was my name for it at the time. So much, much different. Uh, we don't have any guesses. So why don't we just get down to it? You ready? All right. I'm ready. I think the big I, I think the big idea today, you know, we talked about the Kardashians. And I don't know if they had people in their corner or not, Bobby, but they were definitely thinking ahead at the time when they said, you know what? I don't know how much we're going to use this today. Maybe they will use it today. I don't know how much we're going to use this today, but we definitely are going to need this in the future. So let's do this now proactively. And you look at lifestyle inflation that happens with all of us, where coffee goes from being a fun thing to being a daily necessity or the vacation. We can justify taking the vacation where if we didn't have any money, maybe we can't. Lifestyle creep is a, is a real thing. But if you plan ahead just a little bit, and it doesn't have to be, doesn't have to be with a tiller spreadsheet, Bobby. It can be just a quick conversation with you and a trusted person person, whether it's a spouse, a loved one, your, your, your buddy that you hold each other accountable together, like just having that little conversation once a week to kind of look forward at what's coming up and also take a look at how you spend money. That can be so, so, so valuable. I can't, can't uh, talk about that enough. I agree. And I think that everyone should sort of be honest with themselves about what they're really spending money on and whether if the thing, if things would change, whether they would be in a pinch. So take a few minutes, assess where you're going and uh, yeah, definitely reserve those digital assets for your kids. <laughs> that's, that's the big takeaway. Everybody go grab the Twitter handle with your kid's name. Or, absolutely. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> take the time guys though. Make the time. All right. If you guys want to live a rich life, don't forget you got to be financial grownups. And go stack some Benjamins. We'll see you next time back here at Money in the Morning. Bye, guys. This show is created by Joe Saul Sihai, hosted and produced by Bobby Rebell and Joe Saul Sihai is engineered by Caden Thompson and all put together by a pack of well-trained ferrets down here in Joe's mom's basement. You'll find Bobby at the Financial Grown-Up Podcast and Joe at the Stacking Benjamin Show. Go say hi to them there too. Online, visit us on Twitter at Average Joe Money and at Bobby Rebel, or come join a live recording at our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash iStackBenjamins. I know you already know this too, but money in the morning is for entertainment purposes only. You should not act on anything recommended by a bunch of entertainers in a basement or even a Manhattan kitchen without first consulting your financial advisor. And second, dude, have your head examined. Have headlines you'd like us to discuss? Send them to joe at stackingbenjamins.com or put them on our Stacking Benjamins closed Facebook group. This show is a collaboration of Stacking Benjamins, LLC and BRK Media, LLC. Copyright 2019. All rights reserved. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and I reserve the right to always say, we'll see you next time back here on Money in the Morning.